Under the RED program, countries propose projects and generate verifiable credits from avoided emissions which are then purchased to offset emissions incurred elsewhere. The federal government of Nigeria, reinforced by pioneering efforts from Cross River State, started to engage in RED Plus in 2009 and became a partner country of the UN RED program in February 2010. In Nigeria, for example, an assessment of the risks from RED Plus policy measures revealed that a planned logging ban might conserve forest carbon stocks, but it was also likely to increase illegal logging. The Nigeria Red Plus Readiness Program envisions a two-track approach to achieve Red Plus Readiness in Nigeria based on the development of institutional and technical capacities at federal level and carrying out intense institutional strategy building and demonstration activities in Cross River State. Between 2012 and 2014, $4 million was spent on the UN RED program in Nigeria. Every time UNEP or any of the other UN RED partners uh, looks at supporting a country in RED Plus investments, we look at how it can benefit local communities, how it can, can benefit bi biodiversity, and how it can create livelihoods. Um, at the heart of the UN RED program is ethnic, free, prior, and informed consent, which means that no action will take place using UN RED money without the explicit permission of the local and indigenous communities who are affected by it. So yes, we are seeing local communities bearing higher costs than expected, but we're also see seeing local communities um, benefiting from the actions that we're taking. The Cross River State is um, a big area for investment for the UN RED program. Certainly when the superhighway was announced, it sent ripples through the UN RED program. And all I can say is that's a, that's a work in progress. The loss of wildlife and wild habitats threatens important sectors of the economy and handicaps future development opportunities. For example, the tourism industry, while woefully underdeveloped in Africa compared with other continents, contributes significantly to many countries' economies, according to a 2014 brief prepared by the United Nations World Tourism Organization. Tourism in Africa increased steadily between 2005 and 2013, with an average annual growth rate of about 6.1 percent, while international arrivals numbered 35 million in 2005. In 2013, they grew to 56 million. And by 2030, arrivals are expected to be around 134 million people. In 2013, international tourism in Africa was conservatively valued at $34.2 billion. It's only in Africa where the planet's largest land mammal, the African elephant, still roams, where the tallest land mammal, the giraffe, still lumbers, where the fastest land mammal, the cheetah, still sprints, and where most of the world's great apes live, western gorilla, chimpanzee, and bonobo. Yet the wild side of Africa is changing as economies blossom and new infrastructure transforms urban and rural areas. As trade routes between Africa and other parts of the world open and multiply, so do the opportunities for smuggling Africa's natural heritage abroad. Each year, more than 20,000 elephants, possibly up to 35,000, are killed by poachers for their tusks, which are shipped to ivory markets predominantly in countries such as China and Thailand. In 2014, 1,215 rhinos were killed in South Africa alone, which, when compared with the 13 killed by poachers in 2007, represents a more than 9,000% increase in rhino poaching. This dramatic percentage increase is driven by demand from Asian consumers, mostly in Vietnam, who believe rhino horn has medicinal properties and can cure everything from headaches to cancer. The size of Africa's lion population has declined by 30% in the past 20 years, and today only about 30,000 of these iconic carnivores remain on the continent. Lesser known species, such as the pangolin, are also caught up in the wildlife trade. Too frequently, customs authorities in Hong Kong and other East Asian ports seize shipments from Africa containing tons of smuggled pangolin skills. 
As rising wealth and disposable income have grown in Asia, so too has demand for wildlife products, in turn driving up prices for these products. Today, a kilogram of rhino horn can fetch as much as $60,000. A kilogram of raw ivory on the Asian market reportedly fetches more than $750. Worked ivory is worth even more. According to a United Nations Environment Program report, illegal trade in wildlife and wildlife derivatives is worth between $7 billion and $23 billion annually and is driving many species to the brink of extinction. In Africa, this includes iconic species such as the elephant and rhino which are being slaughtered by poachers for their ivory and horn respectively. These products are smuggled abroad, largely to Asian markets, where demand for ivory trinkets are rhino horn medicine are in high demand and typically via an organized network of middlemen, corrupt officials, kingpins and criminals. Wildlife trafficking, but arms trafficking, uh, drug trafficking. And I think a lot of this problem has to do with forced borders in this region. Um, a lot of these problems are tied together due to the economics. So it, it, it's, it's not just a single approach. It's trafficking is like a big ball of yarn and all the different... And the, but it's a bunch of different colors and you pull off one little piece and that's the drugs. You pull off another, the red piece, and, and, and that's the weapons. You pull off this, it could be rice. It, there's all kind of contraband that's moving in, in West Africa. And some of these actually threaten the security of the state. And by that I'm talking about Boko Haram. Governments have also been advised that not only wildlife, but also the landscapes should be recognized for their financial contribution via the ecosystem services they provide. As governments plan for the future and make decisions about development, infrastructure and industry, experts have warned that it is crucial that the country's wildlife and wild landscapes, for all that they contribute to a moral and financial bottom line, be a part of the thought process and planning. Investing in and planning now for the long-term protection of the wildlife heritage will ensure present and future generations continue to reap ecological, social and financial returns.